Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Committee of the Whole on Monday, February 13th, 4.30 p.m. And I'll call the meeting to order. Just a couple announcements. Tom, you've got an announcement on Family Day? Yeah, Family Day this Monday. Unplug and reconnect this Family Day. Games and activities will be at the Badlands Community Facility from 11 till 2. Free skating at the Memorial Arena from 11 till 2. Toonie Swim from 1 till 4. The more activities you participate in, the more chances you have to win one of the three grand prize draws. Here are two easy ways to earn your first prize ticket at the Family Day Unplugged. Bring your own water bottle to the event. Refill stations will be on site. Show your skates and our swimsuit at the BCF for a prize entry. For more information and stay updated, check the Drumheller, Town of Drumheller website. Thank you, Tom. Stephanie, you got something on Freedom to Read Week. Freedom to Read Week is an annual event that encourages Canadians to think about and reaffirm their commitment to intellectual freedom. It's guaranteed to you under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This year, Freedom to Read Week will be observed from February 19th to February 25th, 2023. Intellectual freedom enables people to develop informed opinions about issues that have an impact on their daily lives. Important decisions are supported by barrier-free access to reliable information in books, journals, and other online or print material. For more information, resources, and celebration ideas, visit www.freedomtoread.ca. Thank you, Stephanie. Any additions to the agenda, Council? Nope. Can I get a motion to adopt the agenda as presented, please? Patrick? I move to adopt the agenda for the February 13th, 2023 Committee of the Whole meeting as presented. Seconder. Stephanie, all in favor? Carried. Can I get a motion to adopt the minutes of this January 16th Committee of the Whole meeting, please? Tony? I move to approve the minutes for the December 12th, 2020. Yeah, just, just make that change. It's actually January 16th, not December 12th. January 16th. Yeah, I caught the 23. I move to approve the minutes for the January 16, 2023 Committee of the Whole meeting as presented. Seconder, please. Lisa, comments? All in favor? Carried. And can I get a motion to accept the Drumheller District Seniors Foundation minutes, please? Tom? Yeah, I move to accept as information the minutes from the Drumheller District Seniors Foundation December 2022 meeting as presented. Second, there's a couple of meetings there. There Oops. is an organizational meeting and a regular meeting, I think, was there not? So can I just say meet meetings? Yes, meetings. Yeah. Thank you. Seconder, please. Stephanie, comments? All in favor? Carried. Okay, let's move on to 7.1.1, please, Daryl. Thank you, Your Worship. So before you is a request uh, for uh, information for you, for council to review the bylaw updates from the Drumheller Public Library. So <clears throat> for everyone's uh, recollection, uh, council disallowed the bylaws um, late last year. And so they, the board has come back with some changes that they believe will uh, satisfy town council. And this is a, a request for the board to, or for council to review the bylaws uh, and then direct any changes through the um, council representative, uh, Stephanie Price, to be able to take back to the board uh, with the hope that if there, whatever revisions are done, that they can then be uh, brought back for approval uh, probably in early March. So there's no motion or anything that's required. It's just really more information for everyone to, uh, to take away uh, so that we can bring it back, but we have to introduce it this way. So if there are questions about it or things that want to be made, you want to ask now, you can certainly do that. Okay, comments, anyone? Tom? Yeah, I'm just... Uh interested in the loan of materials and membership. Um, my understanding is that there's no charge um, for the loaning of the materials and the membership. And, and I guess in the past there has been a charge at times. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to not 
charge people for, for this facility and, and the use of this facility and the materials and stuff. Um, but the town does support the library and we are desperately <laughs> in need of, of you know, extra revenue for our budget for the town um, rather than just continually in, upping taxes all the time. So I'm just wondering if, if the library could look at the possibility of going back to uh, some nominal charge um, which, which might allow the town to maybe spend a little bit less money on the library. Anybody else? Lisa? I was just wondering if we could get a copy of the Schedule D that is referenced. And if that can be shared, because I think that might be important information to see. Yep, Stephanie's got that note. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay, so I, I have to agree with Tom on this. Um, I think it's you know, again, we want to make sure it's available to everyone and it's something that everybody can use. And, and there are those who can afford to use it. I think there's got to be something figured out there because, yeah, there used to always be a membership fee and then a rental fee of the books. And now it seems like everything is gone. And, and then I'm not sure, Stephanie, but you guys have fundraisers as well because I haven't seen, I, there's been like the, one thing at the library, but they used to have big fundraisers and... So that would be the li library society that does that, not the library board. Okay. So do you, but does the board not work with the society? Uh, there's some of the board that does sit on the society and they bring some updates back and stuff. They do different movie nights and different things. I can get you more info on that if you'd like. Yeah, please. And also, I, I don't know if the, the whole purpose of this thing was our concern on, on who dictates who. So it's this admittance again. It's uh, item D, persons entering the building used for public library purposes must abide by any measures put in place to protect the health of the library users and staff. So any measures put in place by who? Are they following the AHS guidelines? Are they following, the, like, whose guidelines is who's the who? So underneath, there's the amended version, and that's taken right out of it. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's sorry. okay. Okay, I just yeah. wanted. To, yeah, but but they are they going to keep in there something though about? Um, they're just striking it completely, like they're not. That one was removed completely. Um, let me just scroll down to it. So, um, admittance in there. That one was taking out. So it's not ever going to have to, like, we're not going to have to deal with this when it, if something ever happens again? As far as I'm reading it, I don't see that they could put, like, it says. I just says, don't want to see it, like, I just feel like it should be in the bylaws that they will follow the AHS guidelines. I guess I should have been more clear on my statement, just because, again, that all of a sudden something comes up and then we're going through this again. I will definitely take that back and see if we can get that amended that way. Okay. And then um, I agree with Lisa, we need to see what that looks like on Schedule D. But other than that, that's my comments. Anybody else come back with more? Lisa or oh, Crystal, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just in regards to... Um, just can I get you to speak a bit louder into your... Sorry, I'm trying. Um, in regards to um, number, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just having a hard time talking. Number C, um, I, what are, are the policies or procedures? Can that be uh, found online? Under which, which column are you at? Uh, CI under admittance to conduct in the library space and <clears throat> the grounds. Okay. I think it is online, but I have to double check to make sure. Oops. 
Is that the only one, Crystal? Okay. All right, Steph, does that give you enough to um, go back with? Yes, I will go back with all that and come back with something for you guys. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to 7.2.1, please, Dagan. Thank you. Um, I am just going to pop up a diagram on my screen here while I go through the briefing note update as well. So this has to do with the uh, flood control berm in the Midland area. I'll just show the diagram as well. Uh, so, um, following receiving the tenders for the Midland, uh, the Midland flood berm, we had a look at the costs for the overall project and specifically the leg on the west end of the project that runs parallel to 25th Street and ties to higher ground at Dinosaur Trail and the highway there. And also had a look at the rail embankment, which has been there for more than 100 years and has withstood quite a number of floods. And we wondered if that might be an opportunity uh, since we took over the lease of the rail line um, to make use of that for flood control infrastructure and save some funds on constructing a brand new section of berm along 25th Street. And so we asked Parkland Geo, a geotechnical engineering specialist, to have a look at the makeup of the rail berm and they did a test pit program through October of this year, collected soil samples and, and logged the soils there. Um, they completed some modeling on the, the results of the soils and prepared a report back to us. And in their report, what they found was that yes, the, the rail line could be used to replace that section of Midland berm. The soils in the rail line were not ideal and if we were building it new we would be using different soils for the berm. However, given that the rail line itself is very wide, it's nine and a half meters wide compared to our typical berm top width of four meters, that helps to mitigate against some of the typical failure modes that we would be looking for and testing for and trying to mitigate against with a berm. So things like seepage, overtopping failure, the side slope slumping. And so um, we have decided, um, based on Parkland Dew Technical's report, that we will be moving forward with using the CN rail line as a section of berm. We do need to do a bit of upgrade work there. So we need to remove the gravel ballast from the top. And as well, there's a little bit of other gravel underneath that, which will have to come off and that will be replaced with impervious clay material but um, that should get it up to snuff and up to the design elevations with the impervious material. And so we are proceeding with design work for that. Um, the drawings are being prepared this month and we will get an estimate from our contractor who was assigned this project, um, that's local contractor Southwest, to complete the work and uh, cancel the other section that they had originally been assigned. Additionally, we will need to clear some of the brush that's on the rail line before that work can start, and it will need to be maintained as a cleared piece of infrastructure. As flood control infrastructure, we know we can't have trees and shrubs on the top and the side slopes. And over the long term, the town will be responsible for completing inspections on the CN rail <coughs> embankment section. Um, both regular inspections on an annual basis and also during floods to make sure that it continues to perform as it has performed over the last hundred years during flood events. So we expect that um, based on the cost estimate for completing the original section of the berm and the estimate to complete the upgrades to the section of rail line that we should be able to save approximately $350,000 and the work um, would all be eligible under the flood program. So our, through our partnership with the federal and provincial government and the town. And so we'll be advising of this change on our flood readiness website. And we'll be talking to the contractor in the coming weeks as the drawings are ready. 
Thanks, Dagan. Comments? Uh, I can't see Chris. Oh, go ahead, Stephanie. Can I just get you to take that down, Dagan, so I can see those other guys? I was just going to say it's great that we're going to be saving some money and use the rail line as part of that. So that's good news. Thanks, Dagan. Tom? Yeah, a couple of comments. Um, I, I don't see anything in there that says that we have consulted with CN. Do we have to consult with CN considering it's their property and we just have a lease? Has that been done or will be done? Or? Uh, we had consulted about uh, the previous alignment of the berm, which did involve um, digging into the side of the rail embankment and replacing it with fill. And they had no issue with that. But as the drawings become... Um, closer to being ready for giving to the contractor, we, we will be consulting with CM as well on that. Um, concerning the, the substructure, um, one would think, considering that we've had huge trains traveling over this for a hundred some years, that it would be packed down pretty good and should be pretty suitable. So even if it's not quite the right consistency, you would think it would be pretty solid. Um, and, and my last comment, um, so the stuff on top, the rocks, uh, gravel on top, I'm, I'm presuming that that's fairly contaminated, considering that, you know, we've had 100 years of trains going by, leaking oil and fertilizer and all sorts of stuff. I'm um, just wondering what, what the strategy is for removing that and dealing with that. On the, the ballast and the gravel, we will have to work with our, our contractor and determine what the best use of that material is and how to best remove that. So that will be coming once we have the drawings available and can sit down and talk with them about that part of the work. Anybody else? Oh, Patrick. I just want to note that, um, well, I can't say for certain where sort of the inspiration came from this, that I know council had heard this. The, the thoughts of doing this from people in the community. So uh, to me, this is something that sort of demonstrates that you, we are listening, that um, bring your suggestions, bring your input, and we can see how we can use it. Thank you, Patrick. All right. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. Just one quick one. Um, I know there's a trailway that goes underneath the train bridge that is accessed from that one corner. Will they still have access to that uh, trail under the bridge? Yeah, so as part of the Midland Berm upgrade, we are maintaining access um, from the main berm section down and under the CN Rail Bridge and out to the museum. Did you get that, Lisa? I think you're froze. Oh, she said yes, they are. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, anybody else? All right, thanks, Dagan. Uh, 7.2.2, please, Dagan. Uh, so the next item I have is with regards to our spring tree clearing for 2023. So as we discussed last year, uh, it's beneficial to get in and do the tree clearing early in the spring ahead of the bird nesting season so that when the contractors are ready to start the work, in the summer, they don't need to wait or, or be worried about disrupting any birds or wildlife in the areas of the work. So we did put out a tender um, for clearing trees in the areas of the East Cooley berm, the downtown berm, and a couple of areas in Northrop Heller as well. And so that tender closed on February 2nd, and we received two bids on that. Uh, one from Wilco Contractors Southwest at $182,270 and the second from Wright Tree Service Canada Limited for $192,260. So um, based on the, the two bids, the low bid was Wilco Contractors Southwest and we're moving forward with award to them um, given the amount of the contract that is within the signing limit of the CAO. So we're proceeding on that. And the tree clearing work will be scheduled to start in the next couple of weeks. We're going to have our kickoff meeting next week. And um, we have a couple of deadlines on that contract. All the elm trees need to be removed by the end of March. 
and then all the trees need to be down and cleaned up ahead of April 15th. Thanks, Dagan. Comments? Tom? Yeah, just a comment on the communication process again. Um, we, we have to make sure that we do a very thorough uh, communication process to everyone. Uh, we have been uh, kind of caught on occasion in the past with trees going down and people professing that they didn't know anything about it and were upset. So I'm, I'm glad to see all of the possible communications there. The more communication, the better. Crystal? Yeah, um, just, I'm just curious. It says it's for information request for a decision, but is it automatically um, um, awarded by administration? Yeah, it's something that can be emails. passed okay. by administration, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Anybody else? Okay, thanks, Dagan. All right, uh, Reg, 7.3.1, please. Thank you, Your Worship and Council. Um, presenting a short-term rental briefing note for Council. Um, so as part of the housing strategy, um, we did terms of reference and awarded it to ISL. One of the outcomes was for them to do a memorandum of some of the approaches that we might want to use uh, to um, create a bylaw and manage short-term rentals within the jurisdiction. Um, so, along with uh, economic development and uh, development planning, business licensing, and emergency and protection services, we've been now uh, working together to prepare a bylaw that'll uh, work well and is well researched uh, for the town of Drumheller with respect to short-term rentals. Um, through the research, we know that short-term rentals, um, you know, impact affordability and take units off the market on the rental side of things but they also are helpful for um, tourism. So uh, we've uh, taken a look at the rental units that are in Drumheller as of October this year, and there's roughly 100. And uh, within that briefing note, we compared that to other jurisdictions like Strathmore with 12 and Airdrie with 123, Iracana with none, and uh, more than 1,000 in Camor, just to give you a feel for where we fit within, um, within the spectrum. We did get a lot of feedback from council uh, and administration and business and the community through the engagement process of the housing strategy to put together um, our thoughts on the bylaw and what's needed for short-term rentals. And um, we also met with some of the folks that manage short-term rentals and uh, they agree that um, we do need something to manage it in the uh, jurisdiction. Um, within the briefing note is our framework on how we're going to construct the bylaw. Uh, so we're going to determine uh, which bylaws are impacted and whether or not we should have a standalone one. Um, identify the process changes that are required uh, within administration. Research um, the best fee structure and then if there are fines uh, and amounts and infractions needed. Uh, best mechanisms to manage safety and uh, in best practices for engagement. Uh, we're going to take the draft bylaw forward uh, for council's review at the Committee of the Whole March 13th. And our intent with uh, respect to drafting the bylaw is to still allow for accommodations to support tourism um, and level the playing field for accommodation providers in the jurisdiction. Still trying to protect the supply of rental housing, uh, which is one of the outcomes of the housing strategy and uh, increase the safety and quality of stay uh, for folks that are using SDRs in our jurisdiction. Um, after the uh, briefing note, you'll see the memorandum that we received from ISL with lots of information and uh, comparative jurisdictions in there as well. So just to confirm, this is just a real high level right now. Okay, yeah. so council, do you have any questions of Reg right now? It's just, they're just 
Okay, go ahead, Tony. They're just working on it, so. Yeah, I'm just wondering if the ISL report is, is going to form the meat and potatoes of the draft bylaw that we're working on. I especially like the ideas of, of the the demerit system of, of a license to control the owners. I assume that pertains to noise infractions and, and operation of the home before the license is actually revoked. So I'd like some clarity on that. Um, agreeing that the heavy fines are, are mandatory in order to ensure compliance. I just wondered if um, the assessment, would that be part of the bylaw? Is that a standalone on itself? Um, they should be assessed separately with, with a higher value based on a commercial value. Is that going to form part of the bylaw? We're considering if we want to use that uh, um, you know, framework with respect to collecting fees or whether or not it's a one-time fee or um, but we are definitely, we had discussions today about using a different taxation, uh, but. Yes. Yeah, I think it needs to be a revenue generator for the town, and I don't know that the $100 license fee would be what we're after. Also just wondering if vacation homes would fall into that as well uh, through a separate definition, because again, they take units out of the rental market. They're foreign occupied by non-residents and uh, can be rented as well. So are they going to be in caption in there as well? Um, we haven't considered vacation homes. Uh, this is for uh, short-term rentals. How we've defined it is as someone staying in a property uh, for less than 28 days at this point in time. So those definitions will be clear then? Yeah. Between tourist dwelling, vacation home, and short-term rental. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Crystal? Um, thank you, Rich, for gathering all this information. I do appreciate that uh, we're kind of late to the game in regards to a short-term uh, policy, but also benefits us that we can actually look back on the other communities of our size and uh, based on tourism and what has been effective and what has not been effective once their policy has come into place. So um, I think we're in a good position at the time that we're at to start really considering what our options could be that will benefit our residents, but also benefit uh, our guests too that come to our community. So um, I'm glad you're engaging with the people that are actually operating these short-term rentals as well. Um, I think they have a good understanding and have some good feedback to provide. So thanks for engaging in those conversations. Thank you for the input. Stephanie? Yes, thank you very much for all the information, Reg. I was looking at the um, summary of common municipal approaches to STR regulations. I like looking at the ones from Alberta and BC and hope we're sticking more in line with Alberta's towns. Um, yeah, um, good feedback from both provinces, but uh, from what I understand, we are sticking closer to home, so. Thanks, Reg. Patrick? <clears throat> Thanks for the presentation. Um, just quickly, one of the things that I may have missed in, in going over this, but uh, considerations about parking, if that's going to be something that's in, in the works with it, if you've got a property that has 10 beds and, you know, two street parking things, or hopefully we can make something with that. That's great feedback. We'll uh, definitely take a look at that for the final bylaw. Lisa? I just want to say thanks, Reg, for getting this out. I think we definitely need to move forward on this sooner rather than later due to the fact that we are working on poverty reduction. And uh, if you said we have 100 short-term rentals in this community, there's probably close to 100 people that are still looking for a place to live full time. So most definitely, I'm excited to see this. And um, the last thing we also want is for them to be competing with all of our hotels and motels and campgrounds that we already currently have that are still trying to make a living in today's drum heller. So thank you. Tom? Yeah, I very much appreciate this report. I think it's very comprehensive. 
Um, I think it's very well done. It, it gives, it, it really outlines all of the concerns and all the problems that I've heard from people in the community and, and concerns that I've had myself. Um, to me, it's it's almost, you know, the, the, the conundrum of it's almost be careful what you ask for. You know, we, we have done such a good job over the last number of years of promoting tourism uh, that we have so many tourists coming here. The hotels are always full. So what does that give rise to? Well, that gives rise to alternate accommodation such as the, the Airbnb. So, uh, you know, we, we are kind of a... Uh, we, we have kind of created this problem, and it's a good problem to have, uh, but it, it certainly is a problem. The, the biggest issue that I've heard from people is the, the conflict with the short-term rentals and long-term rentals. Uh, we have to kind of figure that out somehow because we have numbers of people who we've all heard of over the last numbers of years who would, would like to come to Drumheller, got a job in Drumheller, plan to come, and there's nothing to rent. Um, they don't have the, the wherewithal, uh, if they're just starting out, for example, to, to purchase a big house. Um, so that this, this conundrum that we have of the short-term rentals versus the long-term rentals, I think, is the, the number one issue that I can see that uh, will be a little tricky to solve. Anybody else? Yeah, the thing I'm hearing, Reg, um, is they're running a business, basically, so they should be they should be paying like a hotel or a campground or anybody else is paying. Um, the other big thing is, are we going to limit the number per neighborhood? Because people don't want to be surrounded by these short-term rentals. And the third thing is um, a lot of, again, what I'm hearing is they make so much money in those two or three months that they don't have to even worry about renting the place for the rest of the year. So if they're doing that well, um, they shouldn't have a problem paying, you know, proper licenses for that. And lastly, are they going to be um, involved in part of the DMO that, you know, we're encouraging the hotels and stuff to be part of if we're all trying to um, help make, you know, look after the, the funding of marketing and everything else. So I think those are my questions, but I, I think my biggest thing is, is we have to remember they are a business there. It didn't, Airbnbs didn't start out that way. You're supposed to just pull up a piece of floor and stay overnight. Well, that's not the way it is anymore. And if you're gonna run a business, you should be like the rest of the businesses that have to comply with the, the operation of a business. And um, my last thing is the difference between taxes. I think that has to come into play um, because if you are, if it's a, you know, if it's a residential homeowner and that's your primary residence, you pay the regular taxes. But if it's a, if it's a business, um, you should be in the commercial, commercial uh, range of taxes. Those are my thoughts. Anybody else? Okay. Got enough, Reg? That's all great feedback. Just let me look at my notes here. I had a bunch of stuff. No, I think everybody else got them. Okay, thank you for that. And you say this is coming back March 13th? Yep. Okay, and that's for a request for direction? Uh, for review uh, with plans to do first reading the next okay. um, council session. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, let's move on to 7.4.1, please, Greg. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, administration and council members, before you is a request for direction regarding um, a potential implementation of a paid parking program for the town of Drumheller. Some time ago last year, council expressed interest in exploring the possibilities of having paid parking in the community. Um, the size of our municipality would encompass several areas, including parking lots at the world's largest dinosaur, the Swinging Bridge, the Hoodoo Rec area, downtown, and the various town-owned parking lots. Um, 
myself and my department have conducted uh, much research into this area and uh, I'd like to apprise council of how such a program may work. Uh, we have uncovered very many, many different systems of paid parking um, and some require um, great costs up front, capital expenditures, and uh, there are new, newer programs um, that are engaged for less money um, and through a computer app. The, uh, at this time, we're, I will apprise council of what we've done. We're seeking um, support to go forth and uh, find a contractor vendor to help us initiate paid parking this year. Um, we all know the town has many attractions drawing thousands of visitors each year. Um, parking, particularly during the summer months, poses challenges. Um, for my department um, and also for a great many members in the community regarding parking issues. We uh, expend a great deal of time on these enforcement issues with very little coming back to the municipality by way of revenue. Um, by also not having paid parking in the community, the municipality is missing an opportunity um, to collect revenue. Our research has led us into uh, one contractor that can supply a pedestal system with on with the parking, such as in the Calgary, where somebody parks in an area and you log your zone and your vehicle information into that. Um, those can be quite expensive. Each one of those pedestals can cost in the area from ten to $12,000. Uh, one contractor came back with uh, an estimate for us, a minimum of six and preferably 12 to 15 of these pedestals. Um, to go down that road of such a parking system, it has proven success in other communities, but it involves a great cash outlay, capital outlay at the start, um, much installation, coordination with um, electronics and IT. Um, not saying it can't be done, it is done. Um, but then the communities that are larger seem to have greater success um, such as Calgary, they have a vehicle that literally drives around with what's called license plate recognition technology. And it'll read the license plate on a vehicle and immediately compute it and see if parking has been paid for that, for that vehicle. Um, there are other systems we have found that require much less capital outlay. Um, there's a great deal of evolving technology. Um, some of these new systems are very flexible and accommodate a wide variety of parking needs. Um, they're easy to use and evolve with our municip with the municipalities growing and our changing needs. Jasper, for example, has engaged a system um, with a company from the east and a uh, very, very simple system did not require the installation of any pedestals or parking machines, but the installation of, of signs and a uh, had a QR code on the signs, which people could, and maybe somebody has already seen it. And when you sign up for this system, you're good in a great many communities throughout Canada if you were to travel around. Now we have spoken to some of these communities that have engaged a variety of parking systems with the one common denominator to them all is clear, direct communication with the community as to what is going on, as to what the system is, informing people. One of the main questions we get um, and if some council recall, I made a presentation approximately five years ago on paid parking in the community and there was um, met much apprehension on the part of people say parking at the big dinosaur. I'm taking my children for hockey. Why do I have to pay or, or should I pay or how do we manage that? With these computer apps that are evolving, um, there are exclusions for citizens. There are registrations that can be conducted where you go on and, and residences can be excluded. They do a, basically it's being given a pass um, in the system. Now it does require a certain onus on the citizen to do this, but I, I firmly believe that we can communicate this. We could help people understand this um, and um, just having them go to the computer and, and, and follow through with the instructions. Um, so they would be having a, a parking exclusion from, from the fees that the system would ordinarily levy. Um, as I said, the one, some of these computer apps require very little to be up and running. And in fact, one quotes is zero dollar outlay. Um, they ostensibly seek to collect 15%. This is just one vendor, 15% of total uh, revenue. 
um, as well as a 2 to 2.9% um, fee, and I'm not sure I understand it, and I wanted to talk to David briefly, um, gateway or use of, of an app, use of a payment app fee uh, as well. I have spoken to people, um, Mount Royal University, for example, in Calgary, uses a similar system to an app, and I haven't had one person tell me that it was difficult, it didn't work, it was very easy, I was late for class, I, I pumped into the app, I did this, I did that, a variety of stories. Um, so I, uh, there are very concrete steps that should be taken to make it work, but um, pivotal and, and it cannot be understated, the value of a clear um, a prompt, what I say here, informative, direct information for the public, accessible, um, and a continual message, uh, a, a clear, uh, direct message as to how it will work. Um, one community, for example, in the West that employed this system, um, one of their officials advised me that in the first two and a half months, at a community smaller than Drumheller, they took in almost $100,000 in revenue using um, not the, the pillar or, or the installation system, but a system where involving a computer app, signage and direction for people. Um, there was a great much concern that people would uh, um, not computer savvy would want to pay in cash and in fact over 10,000 um, excuse me uh, 7,000 digital payments only 20 sought to make the payment in cash at, at the, the this municipality's town hall so there's no doubt there's growing pains it would be a change um, but I, I believe with the right approach, and I've tried to go over it but, um, quickly, but informatively here, and, and inform you as to how it might unfold. Thanks, Greg. I was just looking, because I just paid a parking someplace and seen who it was, and it was very easy. Comments, Council? Uh, Lisa. Yeah, I've been pushing for this for a long time, so I'm excited to see it. However, I just want to make sure. So you did say that there is a possibility to have an exclusion for locals, right? Like a locals card or something along those lines. Yes, sir. So that was great to so hear. There, um, there, there is a there is an, an avenue in the app which one of their engineers will fully explain to us where residents can go online and. Um, be basically given an exclusion. Okay, and it sounds system. like a good um, opportunity to speak to our neighboring uh, counties to see if they can perhaps subsidize parking rates for those who live around us. Um, also, just want uh, You froze again, Lisa. I'll come back to you in a sec. Go ahead, Crystal. But it's sorry. mandatory. Right. Uh, Lisa, sorry, you had froze there for a sec. Oh, so you said you okay. had one more point. So if you want to give that again. Um, did you get the voluntary versus mandatory part? Uh, no. Start okay. with it again. Yeah, so I just said uh, the hoodoos were voluntary. So with if we can get this implemented this year, then it would be mandatory, correct? That's what I think Sorry, I'm hearing. So you're saying, yeah, well, their intent would be to make it to get the locals set up this year uh, with their free pass, like their free parking, and then it would become mandatory this this year for visitors. Perfect. Yeah. Is that right? As I'm cutting okay, out, right? I'll just sit back. <laughs> Greg's just looking at me, but that's the intent if this all goes okay. through. If not, Perfect. it will be for next year. Yeah, one community had it up and running in less than four months. Okay, so there you go. Given the green light to make it work. Okay, so Greg and them are on that. Crystal. Thank you, and I apologize. I'm having te technical difficulties on my computer today. Um, I just, um, yeah, I, I think it's just reiterating about, you know, <clears throat> the cost of tourism should not be on us um, as residents, right? So if this is a way that we could uh, keep our taxes lower for our residents, you know, if in two and a half months, if they're 
if that municipality increased their revenue by 100,000, that's equal to 1% tax taxes for residents, right? So I think this is a really good um, way to help <clears throat> with those costs for our residents. And, you know, when I'm traveling with my family and we're going places, it, I don't consider not going that place because I have to pay for parking. It's just part of you wanting to do go on vacations and uh, do things with your family. So um, I know I've had that feedback saying people aren't going to come to our community anymore because we have paid parking, but um, I don't, I don't think that's going to be the case. So um, I think Greg for, and his team for all the, the information into this, I know this was a, a huge undertaking and trying to get the information because things have obviously drastically changed in five years since uh, you visited this uh, discussion then. So thanks, Greg. If I could just add one thing, Mrs. Cobra. Um, if it pleases council, uh, to go with a computer app would not require a great, this computer app system, and I'm not trying to oversimplify it, there's, there's a lot of moving parts here, um, but would require not a great deal of cash outlay as opposed to the installation of, of several things which would cost thousands and thousands of dollars, and then to find out that there perhaps wasn't working or it's a two year, two or three year growing pain situation, if we were to go down this road and try this and it doesn't work, there are other options that council could be presented with that may require more of a formal, formal system, but there are other options. But this is a way, one way to get started with one of these apps. It is not, and there's more than one, it's not a great cash outlay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. That's good clarification. Tony. Yeah, thank you, Greg. I like your two option system there, and I'm in favor of the second option there. Let's walk before we can run a cheaper alternative as well. I think we need to be sensitive, and it sounds like it's flexible in regards to exempting residents. Um, maybe some of our trading area could be included in that too. And I, and I think we want to be aware of the impact to uh, downtown re revitalization efforts and being able to draw people there as well. So just to be clear, your RFP is going to be calling for option two. Well, I was, I was seeking counsel to be fully apprised of what we're doing, what we're proposing, um, but, but direction, I was hoping that we could go down the road of the lesser expensive option. If council was agreeable, we can flesh that out. And there are, as I said, more than one vendor. And then your RFP would be issued on that basis then? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Good. Stephanie. Thank you very much, Greg, for all your research into it. It's looking very promising. And I love the fact that the residents can be exempt from it. So thank you. Yeah, we have several things to learn there, but that this is what the engineers and what we have learned. So I don't have all the answers right now, but this is the, the gist of it. Thank you. Yes. Tom. So in, to me, th this is not about parking. This is about the financial situation of the town of Drumheller. That over the last couple of years, we've seen incredible increases in the costs of everything. And that, that's not just goods and services, that's people, um, contracts. Uh, everything has gone up so dramatically over the last while, and our revenues have not. Um, we we haven't gained, you know, a thousand people over the last couple of years uh, to to get that increase in taxes. Uh, we we were very fortunate that we were able to only have a 4.8 increase in taxes this year, and that was that was absolutely sharpening pencils in every possible area uh, credit to all of the the supervisors and the managers and administration for for getting that what this is this is a, a potential revenue generator so that we don't have to continually increase taxes um, and and do we want to have people have to pay for parking we would rather not um, I, I think anybody would say, well, you know, it would be wonderful to have free parking for everybody and that would be more attractive and absolutely. Uh, but, but we have to come up with some way of generating more revenue rather than just increasing taxes and taxes and taxes. Uh, so this, this to me is one of the least painful ways, um, as, as uh, Councillor Soretta said, 
you know, let, let's charge the people who are using our roads uh, coming into the community. Let, let's uh, get some revenue from the, the tourism industry that, that we are, that the taxpayers are supporting. Uh, so in my opinion, this, this is, you know, kind of the, the best thing that we can do uh, to get some extra revenue for the town. Um, my second comment would, would be simply, uh, I, I would like a little bit more discussion or maybe clarification on enforcement. Uh, that we, we can come up with, you know, as we've done in the past, we can come up with bylaws, we can come up with all sorts of rules and regulations uh, that if you can't enforce them, then they're basically not, not worth the paper that they're written on. So uh, just a comment maybe on how you, how you would see this being able to be actually enforced. Oh, Mr. Zrisky, we could... Uh... We could adopt a go down as a road of a standalone parking bylaw. We could make an ad, just talking the, the the paperwork and the authority to back it up. We could make an addendum to the traffic bylaw and make further um, changes in the traffic bylaw. I have spoken to several communities about that very thing. How is it enforced? And even a community in Ontario that's a very high tourist uh, area. Uh, two out of three, just on not numbers of parking violation tickets, were paid at, at the end of the year. Um, their chief uh, bylaw enforcement officer um, uh, found that very interesting. But people still, with I mean, it, I go to Minnesota every time I go to Minnesota, I get a speeding ticket. I don't know why, but I pay it, and most people um, will 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 pay the ticket. Now. Um, some people won't. Now, as for enforcing it, um, I was seeking to cannibalize, excuse the term, but there's no other better way, uh, the hoodoo parking staff with training, making them into mobile parking attendants uh, for this summer. Um, the, these programs can also have a begin date and a sunset date, like Jasper, I believe, ceases their paid parking October 31st of the year, and that's just an adjustment on the, on the system. Um, we've gone through a lot of information with, with a couple of vendors um, and we still have more to learn, but it's a case of um, the actual physical part of it, Mr. Zbyski, is a, a parking attendant is equipped with a device that allows um, to check uh, license plate technology, license, license plate recognition. So they check the plate, they see if, light, if the parking is paid in the app. Parking isn't paid in the app. They can issue a traditional, it, it's a printout off the device and it goes on the windshield of the vehicle. Now, yes, there are people that will not pay that and no system is perfect. But um, I've gotten everywhere from 57% to two thirds of people pay the violation tickets. Now, there's also um, the, the information part about um, can't, people can pay for that ticket at Town Hall and there's still mechanics to be worked out there walking into Town Hall and, and being able to uh, pay the ticket such as they'd pay for their taxes or their animal registration. Um, so there's no catch all to catch everything along this, but um, we would undertake to have reasonable enforcement practices in keeping with what um, our, our bylaw would would state we can do as well as as the com the, the practices in these systems that we're still learning, but they do seem to have some success. Um, the one system they had over twenty seven thousand um, transactions reported to me by one contract, and there was thirteen disputed tickets out of twenty seven thousand. Now that sounds like hyperbola, but that that's was given me by the by the, the vendor and roughly correlated by the community itself. So as I said, um, we've learned a lot, but we have a lot to learn about this as well to make it functional and work in the community. And I'll be happy to come back with more information. Stephanie? With the unpaid tickets, I don't know if you have this information right now, but maybe something to look into. Um, if they aren't paying their tickets, are we sending them to collections? And if they don't pay, it's affecting their credit. So yeah. then you're more likely to pay. Usually for this amount mispriced, it, it doesn't go that far. Um, there is a system in Alberta, but Alberta only, where outstanding fees related to a motor vehicle operation can be committed 
to uh, like an unpaid speeding ticket or, or that's done away with a whole lot of enforcement work on part of the police because now these fees are committed right to the registries. Um, that wouldn't hold though if somebody's from Montana um, or, or, or even another province, for example, unless we have reciprocal arrangements. So these things are new and there are some uh, reciprocal agreements between provinces, but we would have to, again, have an MOU and a contract with, with the province for that so-and-so is a traveling salesman from Edmonton comes to Drum Heller when he's got 300 bucks on the system of unpaid tickets. You know, there are, there are mechanisms to try to retrieve that, but usually collections and those other things are not an avenue that, that, is, that is used. It's more practical to go down the vein of a, an, an agreement where um, uh, unpaid uh, violations associated to this vehicle accumulate at the registries. And that's, I know how it works, but we would not have that at the outset with, with this. We, we could get there, but we wouldn't have it at the outset. Anybody else? Okay, I was just looking up, Greg. Um, I knew that Canmore had done something on their parking. I knew I had it somewhere. They made $836,000 in gross revenue. And they had the same thing, peak season rates and then shoulder season rates. So I think, although we're not Canmore, we're becoming not far from They that. used a system called Blink A. That was Blink the system A, yeah. they had used, right? Yeah. And they, uh, I had contacted them and they got back to me with just some marginal information, but they are one of the vendors. And the one of the, just a little bit of trivia, but one of the initial persons that got the Jasper system running is now in Canmore and they've had to expand from, they've actually got a full-time person. All they do is parking in Jasper and they're seeking to expand to another, well, person and a half person right now to make the system work. So, so. Yeah, they they did the same thing. They kind of started out. Uh, I actually spoke to the mayor there, and they started out with an area kind of like we did with the Hoodoos, just to test, and then they expanded out. So we're doing things very similar, and they have a really good website Sweet. that answers all the questions. So, yeah, you're on to way to go, Red or Greg and team for doing the research on that. And I think you've got a direction from council. You're all good. Okay, we'll get on it in the morning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, well, now we will move into closed session for land transaction development. Can I get a motion, please, Council? Tom? I move that Council close the meeting to the public to discuss land transaction and development and personnel as per FOIP 16. To close disclosure harmful to business of a third party, FOIP 23-1. Local, local public body confidences, FOIP 24-1. Advice from officials. Seconder, please, Stephanie. All in favor? Carried. Thank you, everyone. We will be adjourned after this closed session, and we will be back next week. So have a wonderful